Hello, welcome to the Curious About Nature podcast. Today I'm joined by Neil Riddle, the co-founder and CEO of Power, which is a business that enables businesses to access over 4,300 electrical vehicle charge points by a mobile app and card under one bill. Hello, Neil. It's lovely to have you. We met on a, a business incubation scheme, didn't we? And I remember at the back of my head that you'd said in one of the introductions about your citizen science projects. And I always remember thinking, I'd really love to find out more about those, but we never had the time to do it. So I'm really looking forward today to uh, getting a chance to talk to you about some of the projects that you've worked on. But before we kick into that, could you tell us a little bit about your background? I am an engineer by training. I fell into engineering after becoming relatively good at science when I was doing my studies. And engineering seemed like a, a logical and sensible application of what I did. I wanted to get into water engineering. I wanted to clean up water because I figured that clean water was an important thing to have. And ironically, I ended up working with radioactive up in the north coast of Scotland. So I ended up in the nuclear industry. And then I spent 15 years working in a number of large um, electricity companies, both helping generate electricity everything from coal and nuclear through to wind and solar and then latterly ended up doing a lot of innovation for these electricity companies hence the reason i now run a small company that looks at electric vehicle charging it's really interesting the list you've given me of all of the different citizen science projects you've done i'm not sure how you managed to fit that in around that career as well <laughs> it's, it's... It's an interesting background. I mistakenly once told my school teacher that I was a nature. What I didn't realise was actually a naturalist. And I quickly got corrected on this and I've had that one correct ever since. My father was very into his ornithology. He liked his bird watching and we spent a lot of time studying nature as children. I grew up in the, the sort of highlands of Scotland in the middle of nowhere, a place called Glen Lyon. My brother and I, we had the opportunity to be outside every day. So we became curious about the various things we saw around us at one point. And um, I came inside with a butterfly one day and my mother was like, I don't know what that is. And we slowly started exploring the world of butterflies. So she knew a huge amount about plants, but butterflies, the books are there, all the information's there. So we started exploring the world. But before you knew it, we were doing all sorts of crazy things. At one point, we traveled between Devon and Scotland with a cage. It was uh, made out of mesh, a mesh net in the back of the car with thousands of both chrysalises and uh, caterpillars of the peacock butterfly. And that small experiment turned into us reintroducing the peacock butterfly to an area of Highland Scotland that hadn't seen it for uh, about 20 years. So those butterflies are still there many generations later. So it sounds like that childhood sort of sparked the the idea to get involved in these projects. I'm curious about the Otter Scat project. It sounds really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I moved from the, the north coast of Scotland down to Oxfordshire and I came across a local wildlife reserve called Otmore, effectively a, a flat reed bed. But I, I contacted the RSPB and said, listen, I'm interested in doing some volunteering. Is there anything I can do? And they said, what we need is someone to go and collect otter poo for us. So before you knew it, I was out a couple of times a week walking around the reserve looking for poo. Otter poo is an odd one because it tends to be found in particular locations. They use it to signal where they are. So you often find it on top of stones and on top of logs. So it was always in the same location, but it's mixed with mink scat and the mink weren't really desirable in that location. So we were basically collecting the poo across the reserve to try and understand where in the reserve the otters were living and where the mink were. Otters are quite good. They tend to chase the mink away, being a little bit bigger and a little bit more aggressive. So we were collecting the otter poo, pulling out the fish bones and seeing what was in it to understand where they were living across the, the otter reserve. That sounds really interesting. So how do you identify then? What does it look like? <laughs> Not necessarily about the look. Yeah. One of the important characteristics is about otter poo is the smell. Mink poo tends to be quite smelly, whereas otter poo is a little bit sweeter in smell. Both of them contain similar sort of cartilage and bones and things like that in them. The mink poo is a little bit shorter, a little bit smaller. Otter poo is a little bit bigger. And then you collect it, have a little sniff, and you can quite quickly tell from the sniff. It's weird, though, because you might collect half a dozen mink poos and it smells horrid. And you're like, oh, I'm never going to find this thing. And then when you do actually find the right poo, it smells a bit better and you go, oh, hang on, this might be it. So yeah, you get a nose for it. I, I, I was wondering whether or not you acquired any nicknames from doing that at all, but I'm sure yeah, <laughs> maybe everyone's too polite. Official, um, official poo collector is not on my resume. Yeah, but your resume is really is quite fascinating and the various projects and your LinkedIn profile is like your business profile. What, one of the things that you've mentioned is you've been a, a, a leading UK wildlife photographer. So I, are you still 
involved in photography at the moment? I fell out of love of photography. I learnt my photography back in the days when it was film cameras. I did my first summer job before university and I said to myself, hang on, if I've earned some money, I can go and buy a camera now and was shooting slide film, which is notoriously tricky to get just right. So I learned a lot of skills and a lot of techniques. I'd take the photographs, I'd write it in a notebook, and two weeks later, I'd get sent back the picture and told whether the picture was any good. The world of digital photography means you take a picture and instantaneously you can see what's going on. And people are like, what's this guy on about? What's this slide stuff? So the slide photography was where I learned. The slide photography was where I became very good. And Unfortunately, I got priced out of the market when digital arrived because it was quite expensive to get involved in digital photography in the early 2000s. So I fell out of love with it when I realized I needed to have a huge PC. I needed to have lots of time in the quiet and the dark. You know, and if I was working all day, the last thing I wanted to do was go and sit in the dark processing pictures on a computer. But yeah, I spent several years taking photographs of British wildlife and foreign wildlife. I spent a lot of time hiding in a small hide, looking for various species and ended up photographing a whole bunch of very interesting things. My career highlight in photography was back at Otmore uh, when I was out hunting for otter scat. The reed beds became quite an attractive place for the starlings. So one evening mm. I stayed in the reed beds and waited and we get these drifts, the murmurs of starlings coming across the top of the reed beds as they're looking for somewhere to settle. And it's like being underwater. It's like a tidal wave going over the top. You get this roar of the birds, all the wings fluttering. And they're all slowing themselves down as they come down to the reed bed and they go back up again and they move and they arch and they come over the top and eventually one of them will decide to settle. And if one of them settles and stays still, the rest drop in on it. And then if they're not comfortable, they all launch back into the air again. And it was during that process that I was taking a number of photographs. So I've got this beautiful image of through the reed beds, this murmur of starlings waving over the top. But yeah, that was quite an incredible experience. And it's, it sounds a once in a lifetime capture of that, really. That's a special moment. You mentioned the, one of the citizen science projects that you worked on that maybe wasn't so popular. I assume that by that you meant not so popular with family or friends or something. I volunteered with the the Vincent Wildlife Trust to collect polecats. Now, you don't really catch live polecats. You unfortunately have to collect them dead. So that means you effectively collect them dead off the road. My work colleagues were absolutely flabbergasted when one day they saw my car parked beside the road on the way to work. And there I was walking back down the road to pick up this dead polecat off the road. So what you do is you collect them and then you put them in a plastic bag and you freeze them. I don't have a dedicated freezer at home at the time to be able to freeze a polecat, so it went into my household freezer. So my girlfriend at the time wasn't particularly impressed in finding a whole dead frozen polecat in the freezer at home. Obviously you take them out of the freezer and you send yeah. them to the expert. <laughs> so they get sent by courier in a special freezer bag so that they can be collected and studied. And what they were studying was the genetics of the, the polecat to understand how they had crossbred with the domestic ferret. The two animals are fairly similar and they do so finding pure strains of polecat is actually quite hard i was driving quite regularly across oxfordshire and occasionally i'd find these dead polecats in the middle of the road and you collect them and then they would try and identify the purity of the strain of the polecat and mm. generally they were pretty good but there are parts of the country where the genetics have been heavily influenced by that of the domestic but the only way to do it is unfortunately to collect that whole animal freeze that whole animal and send it to the experts. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing to get involved in terms of helping others to uncover genetics or looking at biodiversity and, and, and so on. It seems like you continue to do lots of great projects. What's been your favourite experience, do you think? In 2006, I turned to my employer one day and I said, listen, can I take some time off? I want to go and visit the Andes to go and photograph flamingos. And my employer at the time was very good. They said, yes, we're happy to do that. Half of it will be your annual leave and half of it will be unpaid leave. So I went to spend six weeks up in the Andes across uh, Bolivia, Argentina and Peru looking at how the flamingos were coping with the, the human impact in their ecosystem. And it was one of those adventures where I went solo. It was one of those things where you take yourself off and you do things you never thought you'd ever do. I spent a night sleeping beside a lake so that I could photograph the birds first thing in the morning in a tent. I woke up in the morning early because I wanted to get out at sunrise and I went and ran, had a good look around the lake, took some lovely photographs and then suddenly I felt really unwell and I wasn't really sure what it was that was making me feel so unwell. I suspect it was the early onset of hyper. It was just so cold and I got up quickly. My blood had started flowing around my body. I went out, I went and took photographs. I was concentrating on something else. So I climbed back into my sleeping bag and spent about three or four hours just trying to warm up back in my sleeping bag. And fortunately I was absolutely fine, but it was that moment when you go, I'm really isolated, I'm really remote. No one knows I'm here. No one's going to come and look for me. 
this is maybe a little bit silly, but it was one of those moments when you realize also that you are incredibly privileged to have had the opportunity to get out to somewhere really unusual, really remote. So that whole experiment was quite incredible. It sounds really, I guess, slightly life-affirming as well. It makes you realize just how small you are in the grand scheme of things. It's funny because you can sometimes feel hugely connected with the people mm -hmm. around you. And you meet people who you haven't seen for years and you go, oh, look, it's a small world. And other times you place yourselves back into nature and you realize that you are, and we are, just a small part of the cogs of a, a much greater thing that's moving around us. How can others get involved in citizen science projects? Yeah, I think it's quite an interesting question because a lot of the time it's right there and it's about personal choice to choose to involve yourself with it. I've told you a couple of stories about some really interesting things I've done. I could equally have told them in a way that made them sound very boring. Twice a week, whether it was raining or not, I had to go and drag myself around a piece of boggy moorland to look for something that may or may not be there. One of the other things I was involved in was counting wild flowers in a square meter of land two to three times a year. So I'd mm. go back to the same plot of land and I'd walk around a square meter and count as many different flower species in that square meter as I could see. Not hugely exciting for some, but it's those sets of skills and those um, experiences which helps you then access all these other skills and experiences and build your character. And yeah, that set me up then for a series of opportunities and curiosities that has enabled me to have experiences that others might not have had. I have a, a fabulous story. My wife and I were in the Highlands of Scotland and I jokingly said to her, wouldn't it be cool to find a whale on one of these beaches? So we happened to speak to the people that we were staying with and said, hey, just joking around, but have you ever seen a dead whale on the beaches? Oh yeah, there's a dead whale just down there. So my wife and I drag ourselves down to a beach. It's not a particularly attractive beach. And on the middle of this big stony beach is this huge piece, I don't know, 40 or 50 feet long. And it's literally just white, sticky, smelly blubber. But in the blubber, you can clearly see is the remains of the spine of a whale. So clearly there was a whale there. And I said, ah, let's look for some teeth. And about 15 minutes later, we find a whale's tooth on a beach, which then leads to three hours of searching in which we managed to turn out three whale's teeth. It's fascinating how the little dots all join together. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is sometimes what we're missing, isn't it? It's just taking a step away from our normal daily lives and reconnecting with the world around us and, and thinking, what can I discover right underneath my nose and underneath my feet? And being open to that, definitely. What other kind of nature activities would you recommend for families that maybe you've tried yourself or you've done with your children? I'm a really bad hoarder. I showed you earlier. I have um, on my desk a little pile of shells I've collected from various places. My children spend way too much time collecting sticks. So they have a collection of sticks, but now there's also a collection of feathers. And every time they're exposed to these things, they're learning a little bit more about that material. I'm not the biggest fan of magpies, but my kids now recognize magpies, which I think is a little bonus. So we're moving forward with the magpies. We can do robins. We're starting to see small species around us that they're recognizing. And that curiosity, that ability to identify a bird, put it in a family, in a group, will be something that they will then learn and foster as their life goes forward. And a lot of it is about making them aware that it's there and then their own natural curiosity will pick up on the rest. And that sort of process of observing, taking a bit of time to observe and understand and be curious about what's around you is absolutely fascinating in terms mm -hmm. of development, particularly for the children, but for adults as well. So curiosity, observation, they're probably the two things that I would encourage the most. Yeah, definitely. Even if, sometimes I've noticed with my daughter who's six, it's just reminding her to stop for a minute and look up or look down or look under stuff. And suddenly you, you can spark those conversations. So is there any other kind of projects that you're doing at home with your family to sort of connect with nature at the moment? We were probably this year going to get ourselves home planters. I'm going to let the children kill some plants. <laughs> I think it's really important to uh, let them kill a plant. Yeah. And once they know how to kill a plant, they probably know what they should have done to keep it alive. Yeah. So we'll probably just let them buy some, some marigolds or some petunias or whatever it might be that they want. It's completely theirs then. Yeah. They can plant it, they can fill it with soil, they can water it, they can overwater it. You've kind of got to make some mistakes to understand how, to, how plants work. Yeah. Um, another one we loved doing was we grew a load of acorns a few years. We put them all in a pot. And and before you know it, we had this massive like acorn bush. The process of seeing a seed grow is something that is incredibly fascinating. How does that tiny thing store enough energy to be able to burst out these leaves and get a root down fast enough and absorb enough nutrients to suddenly turn into what is a small tree? The best thing we can do for future generations is plant more trees. The ones that I really like growing are pine trees, but they're really hard to grow because you get these tiny little seeds dropped out of the pine cone. How do you get them into the right soil and encourage them to grow? We're lucky enough to have a giant redwood near where we are. 
So I've got some redwood seeds, which I'm hoping will appear fairly soon. But the idea that we're planting these enormous trees is quite incredible. Yeah, it's nice that idea that you're going to give back to future generations as well. You know, where, where you are now and, and looking at green energy, that kind of seems to meld very well together with what you've been doing in the past anyway. So I'm curious, how did you go from nuclear to electric vehicles then? It's uh, quite a jump. So I started in the nuclear industry up on the north coast of Scotland, and I did at one point consider just quitting the energy industry and going to join the RSPB and working as a ranger for the RSPB, which is hence the reason I ended up volunteering with the RSPB, because I was like, ooh. I'm still curious. I, I joined the nuclear industry. We looked at radioactive waste. I got an opportunity to work for the company that ran the nuclear power station. I became involved in corporate social responsibility, sustainability. How do you monitor and report some of the activities of these businesses? So emissions of nuclides, emissions of water, management of energy efficiency. Before you knew it, my boss, who was a very forward-thinking individual, had placed me into a, a secondment role with an organization called the Committee on Climate. This was in 2007. I was fortunate enough to be part of a team that wrote the first carbon budgets, the world's first legally binding carbon budgets. And I was responsible for looking at the electricity sector. So I was there in 2007, 2008, trying to forecast the price of electricity, do these complex and numerical models to understand how electricity price will vary depending on the commodities that go in, the cost of the infrastructure. So I ended up getting drawn into a role where I was doing quite a lot of uh, energy modeling. And then in about 20. Uh, 15, I made a massive mistake. I had a forecast for the amount of solar energy that was being generated. And I was looking 20 years into the future, lifetime of power stations. And I had a model that had about three or four gigawatts of solar. And it turned out the UK had actually built nearly 11 gigawatts of solar. I was like, how on earth did I get that so badly wrong? And the reality was that the models and the approaches we were taking were very good for coal and gas power stations but terrible for these much smaller scale, very volatile, very fast moving markets. So I became slightly obsessed with solar energy. I started volunteering for a community energy. We were looking at building uh, solar rooftops in community owned housing in central London. That was where I met my current business partner. But we were rolling out small community invested, community owned solar schemes across London. That was a voluntary role alongside my big corporate energy job. But because I was learning about all this technology, I ended up getting drawn into more and more innovation activity that mm -hmm. included things like battery storage how do you store the energy from the sun which is great during the day but not very useful at night we sadly are quite a wet cold dark and windy island so solar is amazing in a hot sunny country but we just don't get the solar out during the evenings and the night time how do you store it storage became a big question and then i started looking and getting involved in energy flexibility so how do we flex some of that stored energy against some of that energy during the day or other loads? Can we turn our fridges down? We don't have much electricity. What can we do with these variable loads? That drew me into the world of something called vehicle to grid. Vehicle to grid is basically using the battery in the car to store some of that. How do you store some of the energy that we've got in excess during the day in a car battery and then discharge it later? What are the value creation we can get from managing that flow of energy that drew me quite quickly into the world of electric vehicles the smart technology around them how do you control when you charge to better optimize and better suit the grid how do we enable our transport system to decarbonize and this all goes back to that time of the committee on climate change where we came away with this logic that to decarbonize the economy we needed to first decarbonize electricity once we decarbonize electricity we should electrify everything so the electrification of transport became a natural step in my journey i decided to take the leap away from a large corporate job and into building a small business based on some of the technologies i've been learning about and that's what i do today so you touched on it already but could you explain why do we need to decarbonize electricity in the uk up until about 2013, the largest source of carbon dioxide emissions was the energy sector. We were a big, we still are a big coal and gas dominated energy system. Back in the 2007 and 8, when I was first really analysing and looking at this, we also had a lot of oil fired power stations as well. So the oil fires were the most expensive. So on a cold, dark night, we'd burn the oil and that would give us the extra power we needed. All the coal would be running, all the gas would be running. And there was this tiny amount of really hydroelectricity. During that period, we realized, obviously, that climate change is very significant. We need to transition the energy base away from that so that we can move some of these biggest, dirtiest, most polluting assets in the country to something cleaner. And we ended up with the renewable revolution that kicked off probably 2002, 2003, with the combination of onshore wind, offshore wind solar more hydro um, and all these technologies were quite expensive they need to be financially supported to, to reduce the cost of deployment and slowly those renewable technologies have become more and more dominant and that has enabled us to move energy sector from what was the largest source of emissions in the country 
to no longer being the largest source of emissions in the country. So today, transport is the biggest source of emissions, and hence the reason that I'm now looking so much at transport, because it's the dirty part of our, our country. So yeah. hopefully we'll decarbonise the electricity sector, decarbonise transport, and we'll slowly bring ourselves down towards this net zero target that we've set for ourselves. And, and by doing that, obviously, we're, we're going to have a positive impact on climate change and the natural world, aren't we? If I'm curious about electric cars as a family, how much does it cost to charge an electric car? I love this question. Yeah. Because, um, the Scottish are very lucky people. They have a network in Scotland that has been 100% subsidised by the Scottish government. So in Scotland, you can charge a car for free. That's pretty cool. You can drive your car for free. A lot of the electricity companies now have special tariffs overnight when there's a lot of wind, there's not many other people using electricity, and therefore you get some pretty cheap overnight tariffs. So uh, five pence per kilowatt hour, which is the cost of the electricity you might be buying, is probably about as low as you'll get in a home energy situation. That five pence per kilowatt hour, you need a certain number of kilowatt hours in your battery. So from for my math, simple maths purposes, let's call it a hundred kilowatt hour battery. So five pence times a hundred, it gives you the cost of charging your electric car. So five pounds charges up your electric car. A hundred kilowatt hour batteries, that's like the biggest Teslas on the road. That will give you about three, nearly 300 miles of range. So 300 miles for a fiver is one way of answering it. So the answer to the question, how much does it cost to charge an electric car, is actually quite long and quite nuanced. Anywhere between zero and a lot, mm. but generally cheaper than petrol and diesel. So that cost differential is driving a lot of people to consider the switch to electric yeah. cars. Yeah, definitely. So what's next for power? We are in the process of building one of the largest roaming networks in the UK. We're enabling our customers to access many different charge points with one. It always amazes people to think that there are 80 different charge point networks in the United Kingdom. That means you need 80 different cards, 80 different apps, and potentially 80 different subscriptions to access all of those networks. So what we're trying to do is aggregate all of those networks into one place so you can access as many charge points with one solution as possible. And really, our core customer in this space is the reason businesses have a particular challenge is you or I as an individual might choose to use a credit card to pay for our charging, or we might just suck up the, the hassle that comes with it. And so what we're trying to do is enable businesses to get one solution so they can give their drivers a card to get out on the road. They can touch and start the, the charging event. They can use the mobile app to find where the charges are and the fleet manager gets that one bill at the end of it to make it much easier for businesses and individuals to access public electric vehicle charging and therefore transition to electric. It's great to see more people getting interested in electric vehicles. It's certainly something that I'm looking at in my own business in terms of a company car, that kind of thing. And we've been looking at more car sharing for when we've needed to kind of do longer journeys as well at the moment as a sort of interim measure. That's great. Thank you so much, Neil, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure this morning. You have such a, an eclectic background and such varying experiences to talk about. It's been really lovely having you on and, and I hope that you've inspired other people to take those small steps towards getting involved in exploring nature, whether that's in your own back garden or getting involved in volunteering in citizen science projects. So thanks again. Thanks for joining Thank me. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel.